I was fascinated with, uh, with photojournalism because it, it gave me an excuse to be nosy and to stick my nose into, into things where ordinarily I wouldn't get in. I ultimately ended up in Hong Kong and I think it, it was really because of two reasons. One, because of the food and two, because of the proximity to China. And it was a pure, um, it was a pure emotional decision. The bastard chairs are chairs which people have and then they, they somehow break or wear down, they put them out, but in China you rarely throw anything away if you can fix it. I love the uniqueness of these objects. Each chair has been repaired 20, 30 times and you can see the repairs. It's often simple wire, some bicycle clamp, or they'll use a spindle from a factory instead of a foot of a chair to support it or just a pile of bricks. Uh, they reminded me of uh, portraits of people where you can see the, the traces of life on them. And I would look for them everywhere, and that's one of the great things about photography, that you can collect and you create topologies. And the topology becomes interesting because you can compare amongst the set. And I decided to take a series of portraits of people who might just find interesting the way they dress in their environment, not so much their faces, and it would always be low depth of field, so the background was out of focus. And when you drive through the countryside, it's slow, and you'd go through a village, and I'd see someone, for instance, I'd see two girls dressed in these incredibly pink-colored overcoats during Chinese New Year, where everyone is supposed to wear some form of red and they were in their Sunday dress, but they had muddy boots standing in this mud. And if I'd see something like that, I would just tell the driver to stop. I'd get out with my assistant. My assistant would go over and ask them, can this man take a picture of you? Just stand there and think of nothing. It was a form of sociology. And the, 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 secret, the secret for me was always to get them look expressionless. I didn't want them to smile or to look unhappy. I always asked them uh, to be empty. It was crucial for me to use a tripod because photojournalism seemed to me to be such a overly quick process with not enough thought going into each individual picture. It does attempt to go across classes. So you have farmers, you have working class people, you have factory workers, you have a young boy golfing in Shanghai. But that again was really an attempt to get away from this um, photojournalistic way of looking. I had a tripod along and I just uh, started walking and walking every day and I always loved the back alleys. For me they were just uh, these fascinating places because uh, in, in Hong Kong all the workmen and the, the, the cleaning women, after they work they park their carts, <clears throat> they take their mops and gloves, they wash them out and they hang them up. And I'd always been conscious of them and I always found them fascinating. They reminded me of installations. I could envision them literally in a museum. These beautiful constructions made out of 10 coat hangers and each coat hanger has two gloves attached to the bottom with different colored plastic clothes pins. And on my walks I also started photographing architecture. Uh, just mainly whole buildings actually. I'd see something, I'd see this mass of buildings, I'd photograph it. And these prints I also put out. And one of the things that I really learned during my studies when Otto Steinert did critiques, he would take pictures and he would start folding away the edges and he would keep folding and folding. And sometimes out of an 11 by 14 print, you'd have like four square inches left. And he'd say, that's the picture you should have taken. And that's what I proceeded to do with the architecture. I suddenly folded away the sky, I folded away the horizon until I just had this grid left and I thought there's something about that which is interesting and I printed it that way. And somehow that's how this, this stylistic device came about. I call it no exit photography where your eye really can't leave the picture. And I also created an optical illusion of course because uh, since you have no sky or no horizon you really don't know how big the building is. So I found that and I juxtaposed the back door of these installations of the workmen, of the cleaning women, together with the architecture. And that was basically the start of my, uh, if you want to call it artistic career, I would say non-editorial career. I come from a liberal background, a, a politically active liberal family, and I was always a friend of the underdog. I was always on the side of the underdog. If I look at all the journalistic stories I've done, they've always been 
socially aware, criticizing, critical of, of, of working conditions, living conditions. I didn't consciously pursue that path in my non-editorial career, but if you look at all the topics, it basically continues on in that vein. The architecture of density is, is that way. If you look at the next project I did, it was the real toy story, where I did the installation with 20,000 toys combined with portraits of toy factory workers, which also was a, was a critique of the working conditions in, in factories in China, way before this whole issue with Apple came up and Foxconn. But one of the things which I noticed when these were uh, exhibited worldwide, at the openings, about the second or third question which came out of people's mouths were, how do people live in that? You know, what does it look like inside? There are 10,000 windows here, I want to look inside. So um, I decided to, do, to, to try to do a project about interiors. Hong Kong's oldest social housing project was still standing and it was due to be demolished in a year. And all the residents were only going to be there for one more month. I ended up doing a project called 100 by 100. The title is derived from the size of, uh, of the flats in the estate. Each flat is 10 feet by 10 feet by 10 feet by 10 feet. And again, it turned into, into a topology and more of a sociological project because I basically took each picture from the same viewpoint. I opened the door, I put the camera down, a light flash, a little flash from the ceiling, and took only three or four pictures. I asked the inhabitants again to sit in the middle of the room, to think of nothing, to look empty, and then I went on to the next. I'm trying to explain uh, how this city, how this city works, and also, of course, this, this living on very, very, very small space. I don't think there's any other place in the world where you have to deal with such a small amount of living space. I think I really created an awareness for this vernacular in Hong Kong, which is so unique, which people didn't have before, because you always overlook it. You never look at this stuff if you take it for granted. And because I was a foreigner and it was so wonderful and magical for me and I published it and I exhibited, now suddenly people recognize that it is something special for Hong Kong. It's a trait which no other city has. I think there, there's something which the Hong Kong government considers dirty and, and you know, full of rats and diseases. But if you look at it from a different angle, you can really see that it's an expression of culture.